We're not here to impose Canada's way of doing business on our Ukrainian partners. We're here to help them develop their own way of doing things. Hi, this is Captain Adam Morton from the Canadian Army Podcast. This episode is a little bit special as we have somebody joining us directly from deployment. Lieutenant Colonel Sarah here is the task force commander for Operation Unifier, and she is dialing in from Ukraine. Welcome to the podcast, ma'am. Uh, thanks a lot, Adam. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. So I guess first things first, tell us a little bit about your career and how you wound up where you are today. Sure. Uh, I joined the Canadian Armed Forces back in 1997. I went to the Royal Military College of Canada, and upon graduation, I joined the artillery. Uh, I served a large portion of my career in the 2nd Regiment Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. Uh, I've got a variety of experience working at the tactical, operational, and strategic level. Um, I've worked at the Canadian Armed Forces College. I've been a career manager. Uh, I was the director of human rights and diversity, and I've done some time at the strategic joint staff. So currently, I'm the commanding officer of the 2nd Regiment Royal Canadian Horse Artillery, and I'm also very fortunate to be the current commander of Op Unifier, which is uh, Canada's mission in Ukraine. Uh, I'm married, happily married, uh, and I have two teenage daughters. That's quite the resume. <laughs> so tell us about your current deployment. How's that going? Uh, in terms of Op Unifier, uh, that is, uh, for those that don't know, it's Canada's contribution to assist the security forces of Ukraine through capacity and capability building. Uh, the mission began back in 2015. And it was in response to a request that we received from the governor of Ukraine. And the intent is really to help Ukraine remain sovereign, secure, and stable. And our training mission works pretty closely with a lot of other nations through something called the Multinational Joint Commission. This commission includes countries such as Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, United Kingdom, United States, Denmark, and Sweden. And for us, uh, Canada, with Op Unifier, we deploy roughly 200 members to Ukraine every six months. Uh, we are known collectively as Joint Task Force Ukraine, and we operate in a number of different locations. So our primary focus is really to build the security forces of Ukraine uh, to enable enduring reforms. And we do this through a variety of individual training, collective training, uh, specialty training in the artillery, uh, combat engineers, uh, some combat medic training, as well as our military police. So why Canada and, and why, why is it important for us to be involved when there's this whole multinational coalition? What do we bring to the table here? Yeah, I think uh, from a Canadian perspective, uh, Canada has a longstanding relationship with Ukraine. Uh, we have the third largest uh, Ukrainian speaking population in the world next to Ukraine and Russia. So that connection's always been there. So I think it's important for Canada to demonstrate our commitment to this country uh, and stand uh, closely aligned because we... We believe in the importance of them being an independent country and being able to defend their borders uh, uh, successfully. <laughs> and I guess that falls nicely in line with the mission of the CAF in general, so that's perfect. So what are the main challenges for uh, being in a leadership position in an overseas command? Well, I think, you know, primarily the number one sort of challenge is that, you know, I am responsible for the safety and security of all members here. Uh, that uh, can uh, weigh on you as a commander. Uh, but I have a lot of faith and trust in all the leadership uh, that we have here uh, to be able to ensure that our members stay safe and secure and are able to do the job that we're here to do. So, so what's the relationship between the soldiers in Ukraine and the Canadian soldiers right now? How's, how's that shaping up? Yeah, we have a, quite an extensive uh, engagement with uh, Ukrainian soldiers here at various levels. Uh, so at the lowest level, our master corporals, corporals and uh, privates are working hand in hand uh, doing something called home station training, uh, where we're teaching them uh, direct training such as map reading skills, uh, cam and concealment, navigation. So at the very lowest level, we're engaged. Uh, then if you move up to sort of at the uh, first level leadership, uh, sergeants, warrant officer, we get into more advising in terms of uh, infantry skills, uh, artillery courses, uh, engineer courses. As well, uh, we have instructors, sergeants, and uh, warrant officers teaching on the combat uh, first aid course as well. And then all the way up to our officers and MWOs, uh, we're integrated uh, providing uh, mentorship at the battalion as well as the brigade level. I love that that's good old-fashioned core soldier skills too. That's, that's the good stuff. Yeah, I think, I think this, that's something that's very unique about this mission is that we have an opportunity to actively engage our soldiers uh, right, and, and put their skills to good use, helping our Ukrainian partners. 
So what are some of the, <laughs> I know you just said that's a unique aspect of, of the mission, but what's uh, maybe a more unique aspect of operating the Ukrainian theater in general? Uh, operating in the Ukrainian theater, I think uh, having to deal with a culture that's not quite the same as our own uh, would be something that's quite unique. Little things, something as simple as uh, when we eat lunch, for instance, uh, in Canada, you know, we eat between 11 and 1. Here in Ukraine, they eat between uh, 1,300 and 1,500. That might not seem like an important thing, but when you're trying to develop a training plan uh, with our partners, it's something that you have to consider. Uh, obviously, the language is something else that uh, is a challenge. Uh, all the work that we do is primarily done through a linguist. Uh, so when you're working with a linguist, uh, you have to, that, that takes some getting used to. Uh, jokes and certain expressions uh, don't always translate well. So that means that in our messaging, we have to be very focused in our delivery uh, to ensure that we get the right message across, that our training is effective, and that we keep uh, positive and open lines of communication with our partners. I think uh, we covered this also in uh, a previous podcast with the Pete Support Training Center, but yeah, using an interpreter it can be a pretty big challenge because you know you, you have an extra layer of filter and kind of opinions and thoughts that, that you're working through, and the message doesn't always get there. Yeah, absolutely. But I also find uh, for me personally, it gives me a, a second to really think about the message I want to get across. So it's almost like a it forces a tactical pause uh, for you to really think. For someone like me that likes to talk very quickly, it's probably a, a very healthy thing that I get a second, <laughs> a second chance to think before I speak. So what do you think uh, up to this point is one of Canada's biggest accomplishments as part of this deployment? Oh wow, Adam, that's a that's a pretty tough question because I think we've uh, we've accomplished quite a bit, and I think the one thing about Op Unifier is we are trying to uh, create enduring change. So we're actually focusing all of our training assistance on the next generation of soldiers. Um, so it's very difficult. You don't always see tangible results of your work uh, because when you're trying to affect enduring change, uh, you're actually uh, working towards uh, influencing soldiers that are going to be in leadership positions 10 to 20 years from now. So in terms of, you know, what am I most proud of in, for Roto 10? Uh, I think for me personally, it's we've reestablished a very close relationship with all Ukrainians. Uh, we've gotten back to work in 12 locations across Ukraine in various training institutions. And we've done that all faced with the global pandemic of COVID-19, which I think is uh, quite an accomplishment for our tour. And if you consider your average deployment, adding on that extra layer is certainly a, a pretty incredible challenge. And I really appreciate you mentioning the concept of enduring change, because if you consider, for example, Afghanistan or other deployments, you're in there for a very short time as a soldier, and you don't necessarily get to uh, experience that enduring change or the challenges that relate to a long-term kind of attempt to provide support. And people kind of forget that that's the big mission is, you know, a multi-year process, not just your little slice of pie. Absolutely. So shifting focus a little bit, you know, surely these days we've been focusing on diversity and particularly with your background. What role does that have in maybe accomplishing your objectives as part of this deployment? Yeah, I mean, obviously I have some experience working uh, in the diversity field and, you know, I can say that I firmly believe, like the leadership in the Canadian Armed Forces does, that uh, understanding diversity really expands our perspectives and enhances our ability to gather info, you know, improve the accessibility, credibility and effectiveness of our interactions with the host nation. And then specifically from an op unifier perspective, the diversity of the makeup of our task force has really allowed us to have a far greater reach and impact uh, than we could have with a single homogeneous group. So to give you an example, you know, we have 200 members here from over 40 different trades, a variety of regular and reserve force, men and women alike at all different levels. And I firmly believe that, you know, having that diversity allows us to be the only country, a uh, multinational country here in Ukraine, that is also uh, diverse in our assistance. So we're the, one of the only countries that offering uh, training assistance in the individual training centers, along with in the collective training centers, in the officer academies, and in the NCO colleges. So I think, yeah, the strength of our diversity is really what makes this task force uh, so effective. That seems like a pretty big statement. Can you elaborate a little bit on the impact of that within those training establishments? Like what practical impact does that have as part of that process? Well, I think that the practical impact is, is that everywhere we go, uh, we are providing a very solid 
practical example of uh, the strength of Canada's diversity. So in having uh, diversity in our leadership teams, diversity in our skills, uh, we are providing a front and center example for our Ukrainian partners. I think it's also an opportunity uh, to demonstrate uh, to Ukraine, but also to Lithuania, uh, to the United States and the UK, uh, the partners that we work with, the strength of the Canadian Army soldiers uh, in terms of our experience, our knowledge, and our, uh, ex- our professionalism in our specific skill sets. So in terms of preparation for this deployment, what specific aspects did you focus on to get troops ready to get kicked out the door and do what you're doing right now? Well, I think I already touched on a couple of them in terms of we had to get uh, prepared to deal with a culture that's different than our own. Uh, that's where we make use of the training that comes from the Peace Support Training Center, doing a local culture, home nation or host nation training as part of our pre-deployment package. I talked about the language, uh, getting used to working with uh, linguists. Uh, But ultimately, I think what's uh, most important for our soldiers as they get ready to deploy on missions like this, especially a capacity building mission, is really being flexible and open-minded in their approach. I mean, we're not here to impose uh, Canada's way of doing business on our Ukrainian partners. We're here to help them develop uh, their own way of doing things. And that really uh, requires all of our members at all levels to really use their initiative their ideas and be creative in finding uh, creative solutions uh, that are common between our two cultures. Man, (laughs) I really like that. That's a great answer. So do you have a good story or uh, maybe a particular experience that stood out for you as part of this deployment? Uh, Honestly, Adam, there's uh, been so many uh, great moments. I don't know if I can uh, pick just one. I have, lear- I have learned some lessons, though, if you want me to share some of my lessons of being a task force commander, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Lessons learned okay. are important. We got to hear them. So uh, a couple of lessons that I've learned is, you know, as a task force commander, I didn't fully appreciate the complexity of the decisions you face, uh, but uh, I've really learned the importance of trusting my gut. Um, you know, the decisions that come to my level are, are not usually simple. Uh, and if they were simple, they don't need to get to my level. So as a commander, when you're faced with these complex uh, decisions that normally involve like two less than ideal options, you really got to look at and choose the one that's least disruptive to your team. So what I've tried to do when I'm faced with these decisions is I try to listen to the advice and recommendations of my trusted advisors, such as the task force sergeant major primarily and the deputy uh, commanding officer as well. You know, I have a full task force headquarters staff made up of incredibly intelligent uh, officers and NCOs. And I try to balance the risk and the mitigation strategies available. But yeah, nine times out of 10, it always comes down to trusting your gut and going what uh, you believe in. Uh, You know, I think another lesson that I've learned over this mission, especially with our families back home, uh, dealing with the stressors that uh, come with the COVID-19 pandemic, is the importance of leading with empathy. You know, life goes on, whether you're in Ukraine, uh, whether you're in your Latvia, or whether you're back in Canada. And we really can't lose sight of the implications that life-altering events uh, can have on our soldiers while they're deployed. So as a leader, I think it's really important uh, that all leaders in the Canadian Army are fully invested in our soldiers' well-being and their mental health. And we demonstrate to them on a constant basis that, you know, we care for them and we're there for them whenever, wherever they need us. You know, I really appreciate uh, at the beginning of your answer that you mentioned that if it was a simple answer, somebody else would do it. And I remember in the Platoon Commander 2IC course, there's one slide that says Mission Command is something not to be understated. For those that don't know, Mission Command is basically letting your subordinates do what they have. You tell them your intent and they do the thing. And it's just one slide and it says the challenges of being able to do that is not to be underestimated. And <laughs> they don't talk about it again. But that's like one of the trickiest bits, I think. Of, of leadership in general. And here you are talking about that as now a task force commander. So that's interesting. Yeah. And I would say the, the dispersion of our task force, uh, we're spread across uh, 12 different locations, some of them being eight to 10 hours apart. So really, Adam, I don't have an option other than uh, using mission command uh, to be able to command this uh, task force. And I think, you know, part of mission command is ensuring that all your subordinates understand your intent Uh, So the onus is really on me to lay out for the team uh, very early on in the mission, clear direction and guidance uh, so they could get off on the right foot and execute their tasks as needed. What I found worked uh, well on this tour is I brought the team back together again about halfway through the tour uh, to make sure that we all had that common understanding again. And we we did sort of a mission reframe, took another look at the work we're doing 
and then reset and everyone can go back out and, and do good work. But, uh, you know, that first step of mission command is understanding your commander's intent. Uh, so I think that's where, where my role really comes in, especially with a task force that's so dispersed across a large country like Ukraine. Well, I think that gives us a pretty good idea of what the Canadian Armed Forces is doing in the Ukraine. Uh, is there anything else you want to add to that, ma'am? No, I don't think so. But I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you all the great work that uh, the soldiers of the Canadian Army and the Canadian Armed Forces are, are doing over here in, uh, in Ukraine. Awesome. Thanks very much, ma'am. No problem. That was Lieutenant Colonel Sarah here talking to us direct from Ukraine. And as usual, I'm Captain Adam Morton for the Canadian Army Podcast. Stay frosty. Stay frosty.